if you recognized this sung pitch as the note A, you probably have absolute pitch. If you could not recognize the pitch, it may be because you lack the necessary education and training. You have probably heard the idea that absolute pitch is a genetic trait that cannot be learned or the other claim that absolute pitch can only be acquired by people who have musical training by the age of five. Psychologist Diana Deutsch, of UC San Diego, relates perfect pitch to speech and speech acquisition. Let's take the latter a step further and compare obtaining perfect pitch to acquiring a foreign language. First, we see that there is no innate word for mama, usually the first word a child speaks. The word mama is built from speech sounds that are easiest to produce. But its formal representation in English is mother. In German, for example, the formal representation is Mutter. Thus, formal words of a language must be learned at a later stage of child development. Now, the same is true for relating pitches to their note names. The division of the octave into 12 equally distant half-steps is a theoretical concept that lets us talk about these notes. Therefore, this pitch alphabet has to be learned similarly to the acquisition of a word alphabet. Second, the biggest part of our native language vocabulary we acquire during childhood, seemingly without effort or active learning. The same is probably true for the acquisition of the pitch vocabulary. However, since we do not use pitch memory intensively, and no value is given to having absolute pitch during childhood. We neglect to develop pitch associations and instead acquire relative pitch skills. Most of you will recognize the melody of Silent Night, regardless of what key it's played in. This proves that relative pitch is acquired because the brain considers it more useful than absolute pitch. Now, this does not mean that the pitch vocabulary cannot be acquired after early childhood. It is just that relative pitch is in the way, as an obstacle to that goal. Our brain will try to solve questions about pitch using relative pitch skills. Similarly, we experience a priority for our native tongue when learning a foreign language. The later we try to learn a foreign language, the more difficult it will be to abandon the learned patterns from our native tongue. So, we must abandon our strong associations between objects and their native word representation. When learning a foreign word for an object, instead of abandoning our native word, we have to intake a new foreign word representation for that object. Wordgraph.com shows us the following associations to the word house. To allow a foreign word to represent an object is difficult because the older we get the more relations to this object we acquire, all connected to the native word. All the experiences we had with a particular object have built our understanding of that object. To reprogram our brains to accept all these connections for a new foreign word cannot be done directly. The experiences we had will always be connected to this first native word assignment, since there was no other connection at that time. So, if we have to identify something, we will always first hear the descriptive words with the most intense connections, or what the brain thinks are the most relevant connections, the words of our native language. Thus, until this reprogramming has taken place, we have to use a bridge. However, the more intensely we use a foreign word, the more associations and thus relevance this new foreign word will take on. If we are living in a foreign country, the language spoken there may become the one in which we think of things. Thus the newly acquired language may become more relevant in our life than our native tongue. This situation is also known as thinking in a foreign language. Third, for the pronunciation of words it is even more difficult to be accurate, since the control of our vocal cord muscles stops developing after we have mastered our native language. Or, at least, it is very hard to train your vocal cords without appropriate feedback to guide such efforts. Therefore, it may seem nearly impossible to regain the ability to identify pitches, because the relative pitch characteristics, present in all songs and musical activities, will take precedence over absolute pitch detection skills.
Now, we know that we are capable of learning a foreign language. We also know that it may take many years of daily practice and use to acquire a foreign language. To perfect such a skill, we have to listen to native speakers and actively use the language for quite some time. Usually, in respect of language comprehension, you cannot outrun a native speaker who has acquired the language from day one. The process of acquiring one's native language is a continuous, lifelong process. However, a foreigner who adapts a foreign language can outperform a native speaker who cares little about his language. For example, the native speaker may not care about spelling, correct grammar, or expanding the vocabulary. So, what does this all mean for acquiring absolute pitch? We think that absolute pitch can be learned like a foreign language. The main barrier is the time and effort needed versus the gained ability. For example, it would be nice to speak Chinese perfectly. But how many of us actually will start a year-long course for learning Chinese? Motivations to learn Chinese may be much stronger than those for acquiring absolute pitch. For example, in learning Chinese, you have the possibility to enter the lucrative and expanding Chinese market. Chances are higher that you can profit from language knowledge than if you learn the musical alphabet. Even if you stop the Chinese course after a year, you are still able to use your knowledge to some degree. For absolute pitch this is only partially true. You might go along using relative pitch quite well. Since there are basically only 12 notes that you must be able to recognize, your motivation will rapidly decrease if you cannot see progress after a few days. So, people are spending 5 or 10 years of daily training to learn a foreign language, but almost no one will spend such an amount to acquire absolute pitch. Two primary reasons why people continue to learn a foreign language are 1. Motivation to reach a goal and 2. They see progress. Yes, your vocabulary and understanding of the foreign language grow noticeably over time. Now, to learn absolute pitch, little seems in favor of the learning process. The uses for absolute pitch are rare, and real progress is not always obvious. However, in the latter point we can help you by tracking your progress. And, for the first point, we know a good reason to motivate you to acquire absolute pitch, orientation. Let's compare musical orientation with finding a location on a map. If you have only relative directions. For example, after four blocks turn right. Then you might get into trouble. If the third block turns out to have a very small intersection. Did the directions count this one as a block or not? Absolute orientation points such as a church, a railway crossing, a warehouse, or a street name, will give you more confidence in directions and confirm that you are on the correct path. In music, absolute pitch might be seen as the equivalent of you know where you stand. This is especially important for a cappella singing. Let's assume your relative pitch sense is always 5 cents flat. So, after 20 notes, you would be 100 cents flat, or a semi-tone off. If you are not absolute pitch oriented, you would not realize you are off a semi-tone. If you have absolute pitch to a precision of 20 cents, then after 5 notes you would realize your deviation from the correct pitch. Fortunately, we seldom sing or play without accompaniment, so most often we synchronize with the accompaniment, and avoid drifting off key. So, orientation is not really a compelling reason to acquire absolute pitch. However, a good ear is still one of the most important skills for any musician. So acquiring absolute pitch can be used to set as a measurable goal for ear training. However, the progress should be trackable. Searching around in the dark, not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel is frustrating. So we have introduced the following three methods. The singing funnel method, the octave anchor pitches method, and the interval overtone method. The first, the singing funnel method is most important. We believe in a strong relationship between memory, muscle activity, and imitation.
In other words, you must use your vocal cord muscle movements to capture sound characteristics. We know that every voice is very personal. You may not like the idea of presenting your voice to someone else for the purpose of getting feedback over a long time. Aggravating the situation will be that this person must have the ability to recognize pitch, therefore correct your performance relentlessly, which could prove distressing. Fortunately, technology allows us to give you feedback on your pitch performance without engaging a pitch experienced person. So you can learn to control your vocal cord muscles at your own pace and free from interpersonal stress. Yet, this alone may not give enough motivation to keep you going. You still might say, I tried 10 times and failed to give the correct answer the other day. This is where our funnel method comes to your aid. From the beginning the funnel allows you to score, even if you are more than two whole tones off. Do not underestimate this first step. The points are not just given for free, you still have to concentrate on the sound production process. To introduce you, the method starts with only two notes. Choose notes that you can hum or sing comfortably. For example, C3 and D3. In each subsequent lesson we add additional notes for you to master. That is, before we start to narrow the tolerance. We expand our vocabulary to 3, 5, 8, 13, and finally 18 notes. Once you have mastered this level, you start again with the first two notes. However, this time the allowed tolerance is narrower. In this way the task of producing a certain pitch accurately requires more attention. At the same time your listening skills will improve. Your ability to determine the deviation from the target pitch will increase. Failures within the narrower bands will occur again. However, because we track your progress, you know that you were able to do it for a larger tolerance. Go back and verify that indeed you made progress that has lasted. You might have to repeat the previous level again, but you will master it much faster. Therefore, you will admit that, at least partially, the sounds stick with you. Practice will ensure that you will fail less and less. So you will produce, and therefore recognize and remember, pitches to ever better accuracy levels. However, depending on your musical background, it may still take a year, or more, of daily training, until you have enough fine control of your vocal cord muscles, so that with the imagination alone you can hear the sound with your inner ear to a desired precision of 50 cents. Are you disappointed about the time frame needed? Remember, in learning a foreign language, depending on your age and other language experience, it may take even longer to acquire a basic language certificate. To accelerate the learning process we suggest that you use the octave anchor pitches at the same time as the singing funnel method. The octave anchor pitches method supports the singing funnel method in helping you to orientate yourself better in the pitch realm. Anyway, your voice range will most likely not span four octaves. So you'll need another method for learning to recognize the pitches outside your vocal range. As the name implies, in this method the characteristic of a particular note is presented in all octaves. First you learn to distinguish the C's by octave. Since there are only five notes, C2, C3, C4, C5 and C6, it should be fairly easy to distinguish them. Thus giving you anchor pitches an octave apart. So, when you are asked to identify the sound you hear, it should be fairly simple for you to give the correct answer in the exercise. You may be tempted to continue quickly. On to the next lesson, where we add the G's. But we recommend going slowly, take your time. For the orientation process it is more important that you learn to distinguish and recognize these five notes perfectly, than to encounter the land of endless possibilities. Don't worry that you will recognize these five notes only in this exercise context. You can generalize the skill to other instruments later. In this setting, the idea is to learn to exclude wrong notes among a small set, 
and to identify the correct note. In this exercise we exclude other notes that don't belong to the set of five. So you will be certain that the note you're asked to identify belongs to the small set presented. The method builds on expanding a solid knowledge base with similar characteristics. Notes an octave apart have a strong relationship. This approach assists you in building anchor pitches. The method will add new notes very slowly, just one other category of sounds at a time to the sounds already learned. You are advised to learn to recognize these old and new notes within this limited context until you can assign all the pitches consistently to their corresponding notes. When you are able to distinguish all the C's, the method continues by adding all the G's. That is G2, G3, G4, and G5, the notes in red. In this exercise you will easily recognize when a note with a different characteristic, the G characteristic, is played, since it will sound different than the C's you will have learned. Since you can rely on the new, unrecognizable, notes as G's. It should not be too complicated to assign the G to the appropriate octave. Especially because you will already have built an anchor of C's in your inner ear. If we look at the distances between the notes and half steps, we see that the C's are 12 half steps apart. By adding the G's, the distance that distinguishes the pitches decreases to 7 half steps between C and the G above it or five half steps between the G and the C above it. Instead of the G's, we could have taken the note in the middle of the octave, the tritone. The tritone sound would be easier to distinguish from the C, or the interval between G and C, because its interval sound has less in common with the C octaves, or with the G and C interval. However, we have our reasons for proceeding this way, and explain them in our interval overtone method. So. First learn the G's until you can differentiate and assign the C's and G's with 100% accuracy. To be successful with the exclusion method you are forced to deal intensively with the notes already learned, and the new notes. When you are ready for the next step the method continues by adding the next strongest overtones, the F's. Now there are 13 notes, with 3 tone characteristics to choose from and you will have to listen more carefully to distinguish the notes. But you will see that distinguishing all 13 is still achievable within this exercise. If you make too many errors, you may need to return to the previous level with fewer notes to refresh the pitches already learned. Now, if you think that it is not worth the effort because you would never find yourself in such a setting as this exercise, trust us. If you can distinguish the notes in this exercise setting, you will be pleased to observe your progress. Note by note. And that is an important point, you can track your progress. You will also realize that the process of learning to differentiate pitches is needed in order to set out on the pitch recognition path. The next method, the interval overtone method, introduces you to learning relative pitch. Can you name a song that begins with an ascending perfect fifth? Do you know one? No? Then you can benefit greatly with ear training. You can start by learning the relationship of intervals in openings of songs. Here is a list of the 13 simple ascending intervals of an associated song. Note, no musical experience is required to learn these relationships, they can be learned by road and memorized. Let's do a short test that contains only the perfect and major intervals. For the test, we randomize the song list. Now, it's your turn. Which song starts with a major second? Good. 
Once you have learned the song openings on this list you can learn to recognize the songs from the melody alone. So, you should recognize the melody without the words being sung. If you like the sample songs for the intervals, it will not be difficult to recognize the melody. Let's do a melody recognition test. Click the song you hear. OK. This was not too difficult. Now we will remove the song names and replace them with the opening interval name. Click the appropriate interval name. OK. Learning to relate song names to intervals is a simple but effective way to acquire relative pitch. We recommend that you make yourself a list of your favorite songs. The interval overtone method guides you in the interval recognition process with a step-by-step -step approach, similar to the octave anchor pitches method. Instead of single notes the method presents you intervals. We believe in learning by doing, and that memorizing is easier when practicing the concepts. To recognize something, you must first have a reference in mind. Therefore, it is important that you build a retrievable association for each interval. Unfortunately, the human voice is not constructed to sing two pitches at the same time. So the only activity we can do is to memorize the sound of an interval, and to sing or hum one note after another. The overwhelming contents, lyrics, rhythm, etc., and therefore abundant information a whole melody contains, make it easy to remember a song. So we only need to return to the beginning of a song that starts with an associated interval, to be able to hear the interval in our mind. Once we recognize a melodic interval fairly well and quickly, and on different starting notes, we can meld the two starting pitches into one harmonic interval. It is the harmonic interval characteristic we want to learn to recognize. The interval listening skill is the ability to hear the frequency ratio of two pitches. This frequency ratio makes up the characteristic sound of an interval. This frequency ratio stays the same for a particular interval, independent of the absolute pitches of the involved notes. For example the ratio of an octave is always 2.0. We use a learning box, see video interval instructions to learn to listen for specific interval characteristics. As with the single note recognition process, we start with a simple repertoire of only two interval characteristics, the octave and the unison. Despite the fact that the octave and the unison share a strong relationship physically, as the octave is the first overtone, it is fairly easy to distinguish the two intervals. In effect, the unison sounds like one pitch, not two different ones. This should make it easy enough to distinguish the two interval characteristics. Now the method builds on by adding new intervals to intervals already learned. To learn to recognize the new interval characteristic, we use the approach by exclusion. For the exclusion method to be effective, we must first learn to differentiate intervals with the most in common. Because interval characteristics that have the most in common are the most difficult to differentiate, it's easier to learn the characteristics in the succession of their similarity. Now, what do we mean by most in common? Every natural sound has overtones. A pure pitch is a sinus wave.
it sounds very dull compared to a real sound. If we take a look at the frequency domain, the spectrograms look like this. The pure sound has only one sharp peak at 131 hertz, whereas the flute has several additional small peaks. These peaks represent higher frequency pitches, called overtones. Since real instruments produce overtones, we can build intervals between any two overtones an instrument produces. For example, the interval from the fundamental tone or bass sound, C3, to its first tone overtone, C4, is a perfect octave. Because the intensity of the overtones declines with the overtone number, the order in which the overtones occur is important for the listening experience. With each overtone a new interval characteristic is revealed. So let's go through the occurrence order of the overtones and their inherent harmonic intervals. To visualize the overtone series let's look at a string that vibrates with 131 hertz, the note C3. First, we have the fundamental tone with no overtones. With only one tone, on which we can build, we can build only unisons. Because this is a theoretical overview of overtones, to make the learning process smoother, we will postpone auditory samples to the end when we recap the intervals. Physically the most simple wavelength change is accomplished by having the wavelength. Since a string has the freedom of form, the original string can and will also swing with the shorter wavelength. Thus it produces the first overtone, the note C4. This leads to the interval of a perfect octave. Further this means almost every sound will contain, as a strong overtone, an octave of its fundamental pitch. Therefore, with every pitched sound, we will also hear the octave interval characteristic. The next simple wavelength change is to divide the wavelength into three parts. This shorter string swings at triple the speed of the original, and corresponds to the note G4. So, the next overtone each sound has, in addition to the octave, is the perfect fifth, and therefore the perfect fifth interval characteristic. When we divide the fundamental wavelength by 4, we get an octave of the octave, the note C5, which is not really of interest. However, since the G4 already exists as an overtone, we can now hear the perfect fourth interval characteristic between G4 and C5. By dividing the fundamental wavelength by 5, we get the interval characteristic between C5 and E5, a major third. If we listen carefully to our interval overtone series, we can also hear the interval of a major sixth between G4 and E5. Now, we think that the next forthcoming overtones are already so weak, that combinations of intervals already revealed are more important, than intervals revealed with the next very weak overtones. Don't forget, an overtone also has its own overtones. These overtone vibrations support each other, since they fall into natural wavelength divisions. For example, the first perfect fifth produced, the G4 has itself an overtone of an octave, resulting in a G5. But the first perfect fifth also produces a perfect fifth as the second overtone of its own, resulting in a D6. Since the note C5 has a C6 as its first overtone, we can hear an interval of a major second from C6 to D6. Thus, we can hear a major second without going any further up in the overtone series than two overtones. So, we can construct a major second solely from octaves and a perfect fifth. Let's look at possible additive combinations of the P5, P4 and M3. We believe that the intensity of the combinations are not differentiated enough, that the order in which we learn them is relevant. So, for symmetrical reasons, we have chosen to learn the major second as the next interval. Or, if you want to mend a net, stuff a largest gap first, in this case, the gap between C and E. Finally, we stuff the next largest gap in the scale, between A and C, with a major seventh. If we use subtractions, we can construct all minor intervals.
but we will not get a tritone without using at least a combination with three of our four basic intervals, P1, P5, P4 and M3. We continue with minor intervals, but we do not propose a specific minor interval as the next interval to learn, because now the remaining intervals fit between a pair that are familiar. So the perfect and major intervals land on an orientation grid showing us where to place the minor and tritone intervals. Let's recap the order of the intervals for this method's learning process. Perfect unison. Perfect octave. Perfect fifth. Perfect fourth. Major third. Major sixth. Major 2nd Major 7th Now, for the minor intervals the order in which we go about learning them is no longer relevant. Because we learn them by fitting them on a grid between known interval characteristics. Thus, we learn to detect the characteristic ratios of these intervals by fitting the sounded ratio between known ratios. We emphasize the order in which you learn the notes or intervals as more important than the speed with which you progress, by visualizing the relationship between the interval characteristics and the learning order. Let's introduce symbols for the interval sounds by connecting their points to a circle. Each new overtone in the interval overtone series will be displayed with an additional point. So, beginning with an empty circle for the fundamental or unison. The first overtone in the overtone series, the octave, gets an additional point and thus consists of two points. By adding points, we get the following symbols for our selected order of intervals. Perfect fifth, perfect fourth, major third, and so on. Now visually the symbol of the tritone has more resemblance to the unison than the octave. But auditorily, the contrary is true. Since the octave is the first natural overtone, the perfect octave shares the most sound characteristics with the unison. Therefore, for a visual expression of the difficulty of distinguishing these sounds, we must reverse the symbols. In this way we can show why it's better to listen for interval characteristics one by one and why it's better to learn the most similar interval distinctions or those that are most difficult to differentiate first. Since the overtones are naturally, in a specific intensity order, and always simultaneously present, we will also listen to the previous interval characteristics in addition to the characteristic we are just learning about. So, first we have to add the fundamental to all characteristics. Then every characteristic after the octave characteristic will also contain the octave characteristic. The same is true for the perfect fifth characteristic. And so on. All other overtone intervals characteristics are present in the tritone. While it is true that it is easier to distinguish a tritone from an octave or a unison than a perfect fifth from an octave or a unison. It makes no sense to learn the tritone first, because in our systematic learning approach, we want to learn the characteristics one by one. It is much simpler to differentiate between only two interval symbols, therefore easier to learn the interval-specific characteristic in a step-by-step -step approach, than to extract a specific interval characteristic from complex sounds, accompanied by other interval characteristics. Or in other words, it is difficult to concentrate on a single interval characteristic if you have many competing interval characteristics. Using our method you learn to grasp interval specific characteristics as they appear naturally, with decreasing intensity. Not the interval itself, with its entire harmonics. So, if you want to learn to hear the perfect fifth, you should isolate the perfect fifth characteristic as much as possible from other characteristics that are also present. If you know the interval characteristics that come before that of the perfect fifth, then you can focus on learning the new perfect fifth characteristic by listening to a standard harmonic perfect fifth until you have fully grasped the difference between the previous interval characteristics and the new perfect fifth characteristic.
Thus each interval you learn should contain as few other interval characteristics as possible. A tritone played harmonically supports all interval characteristics. Whereas a perfect fifth played harmonically, alongside the main characteristic of a perfect fifth, will emphasize only the unison and perfect octave interval characteristic. By adding only one new characteristic at a time, the one occurring naturally within the overtone series, you learn two separate interval characteristics from each other. To come to a conclusion with the exclusion method, you must consult the familiarized interval characteristics intensively. Hence you deepen the relationship between the intervals along the intensity of the overtones. Unfortunately, one must be patient and make sure not to progress too fast. The exclusion method only works if you can depend on familiarized material. However, that doesn't mean that you should avoid practicing with other methods in parallel. But, when doing exercises with our octave anchor pitches or interval overtone methods, please do not skip forward until you have reached a satisfactory level of confidence. It is like building a tower, most of the work and time goes into building the foundation. And, if you trust the underlying foundation, you can feel free to move on to the next level securely. Important, we recommend you never start a day with a new lesson. Instead, always do a warm-up with the last successful lesson. And continue with the next lesson once you have demonstrated mastery in the previous level again. From the fourth overtone, which reveals the major third interval characteristic, and on, we must listen carefully, almost straining our ears. Because no new overtone is needed to build the major sixth, its characteristic is equally present when we learn the major third. However, because at this point, you are familiar with the basic repertoire of characteristics, you can begin to combine them, and start recognizing intervals this way. The step-by-step -step approach makes the identification process easier, because you rely on the newly learned characteristic, which is unique from those already learned. A remark about single tone recognition. Because every sound has the same relative overtones, no apparent order exists between single note sounds. However, the octave anchor pitches method uses these landmark pitches. As we expand our repertoire relative to them. Thus, again, we have an order to the starting anchor pitches. The singing funnel method uses muscle activity to learn to memorize a sound. Since small muscle movements are easier to execute. You should avoid starting with sounds an octave apart, because the overtone series is not relevant for the singing funnel method. You can start with any notes you feel comfortable singing, you should not feel bound to any order. Thus, using the singing funnel method, if you notice that in the singing funnel method you have a good feeling for singing the note D, then you could use the note D instead of C as an anchor pitch in the octave anchor pitches method, and adapt the method from there using the training mode in our exercises. However, we do not recommend this. Because the temptation that you would like to change the anchor pitch again, later in your studies, is very high. In this way you may advance faster in the beginning, but you lose the all-important orientation. Here, discipline and stubbornness are the order of the day. And since the key of C is very common in music, our proposed way is the best choice. To stay motivated to continue something, it is important to see progress. Therefore we have introduced a statistics timeline. The statistics timeline will show you, in numerical and graphic form, where your scores hover. To the left in the numerical view, you'll see the dates of training. And in the columns for each lesson you'll see the successful and missed attempts for that day. In the graphic view, you'll see a representation of the ratio of correct to incorrect answers. However, for space reasons only every third day is listed on the left side. And only the main topic is listed in the title. Under the heading 480 cents precision, the first column stays for the exercise with two notes. Going from the bottom to top, you can track your daily progress. Going from left to right shows an increase in difficulty.
The results for each day in exercise are depicted as a small ratio bar. Here you see an enlarged view for May 31st, and the exercise with three notes at a precision of 33 cents. On that day the student doing this exercise had about 40% incorrect and 60% correct answers. When the bar is red, the ratio is less than 10%. A green bar denotes a ratio better than 90%. Your progress pattern will likely not be as smooth and linear as depicted here. As long as the picture gets greener towards the top over time, you are making progress. Don't be discouraged if, at a later time, some red spots occur in lessons you previously mastered. In case of setbacks, you can remind yourself you were able to reach a certain level before and simply repeat the previous lesson. Even if you miss the goal in the first repetition attempt, you should soon realize that you can reach that level again, and more quickly now. We hope this knowledge about your learning process convinces you to go forward with the method. Happy progress! And please send us your statistics timeline after 100 training days, so we can continue to improve our methods. Thank you for supporting and spreading the word about our ear training methods.